You were at a panel today talking about conservatism in the age of Trump. Uh, what about doing history in the age of Trump? Well, I was listening to the panel and it, it was a very interesting experience. I mean, partly because there were so many people, that's really um, uh, a kind of exciting atmosphere. Very often at these conferences, you feel that you're in the presence of three old ladies and a cat. The atmosphere is so somnolent and the audience so sparse. But yeah, this was a vibrant session. And, and obviously, you know, it touched nerves because there were people in the, it emerged from discussion in the audience that people were actually worried about their tenure or whether if they're teaching assistants they're going to be able to carry on in the classroom in state universities or in high schools where the power of the populace and the um, anti-elite elitists is so great that, you know, they're... They feel, they genuinely feel that their livelihoods are, are threatened, and I found that touching and disturbing. But it was a very American centric occasion. It was about teaching conservatism in the age of Trump. And if there was one thing that everybody seemed to agree about, it was that Trump isn't a a conservative, but the standards of conservatism people use are all American standards. And you know, nobody referred to anything earlier than the 18th century. And people said that conservatism is you know, a movement or it's a, uh, it's a state of mind or it's a disposition. But of course, it's also a philosophy. And I thought that probably you know, what the panel needed was more global perspective, more long termism, more long durée. And I guess that's what the world needs in the time of Trump. <laughs> a bit of perspective, because, you know, he's a blip. And American, all American presidents are blips, especially since they changed the Constitution to make, you know, two terms the maximum. I mean, you know, God help us, I, if he gets a second term, which seems may sound like it, but that's the worst thing that could happen, you know. And that's, I find that consoling. You know, there will be there will be life after Trump, and, and of course the other thing about American presidents is that once they're around, they can do very little, except start wars, which I admit is a really big danger. But I don't think Mr. Trump will start a war. And there's very little else that he can can do. Almost all of his promises were insincere to begin with, and in unfulfilled in the event. And that's actually quite normal for American presidents. Your famous checks and balances do a really good job at restraining what the president does. Whereas, you know, the institutions of the populace heat, the universities, the judicial institutions, um, the Congress, the press, um, those th the Constitution, you know, those things go on and on and on, and Mr. Trump isn't going to do anything to subvert. The environment is one area that I know a lot of people are worried about because Scott Pruitt at the EPA, he keeps rolling back regulation after regulation. Just today, he's indicated he's going to allow uh, oil uh, drilling off of both the East Coast and the West Coast, and that hasn't been permitted in decades. Yes. Well, this is an abominable uh, um, fact, and, um, and it does tie in with something which is characteristic of the Trump presidency, which is um, a, a barbarous and exploitative attitude to everything, you know, people, as well as the um, environment. But the environment is also, you know, very durable. Um, we, I think one of the most depressing features of human arrogance and self-congratulation is that we think we've got the power to wreck it, but we haven't, you know, and, and in spite of our um, dismal record as stewards of creation, you know, there are a lot of species out there that have been around for scores, hundreds, in some case, cases of some bacteria, thousands of millions of years, and they'll still be around after we're gone. And the, again, the amount of damage that the Trump administration is going to add to what we've already altogether done to the environment is actually going to be very small. And I, I don't know whether that's at all consoling. And I don't say it you know, in order to prevent 
people, deter people from activism on behalf of the um, environment. But really, uh, it's not politically correct to say this, but like so many other politically incorrect things, it's actually true. The environment is just bigger than all of us. George W. Bush, another president whom I didn't admire very much, did say one very wise thing, which is, you know, nature is the world's biggest superpower. And what we do to the environment is very small compared with what the environment does to us. And the biggest, you know, threat that people seem to be worried about is climate change. Well, that's really in the hands of the sun. You know, the sun is the biggest influence on our planet. It's 93 million miles away. We can do nothing about it. And, you know, even if the Kyoto Protocols were fulfilled, global warming would still go on. You know, the problems are not going to go away, however much we rectify our own behavior. Of course, we should rectify it, because the global climate situation is so appalling that every little we can do to help, we ought to do, and it's iniquitous that the Trump administration doesn't acknowledge that and realize it. But we probably shouldn't worry ourselves sick over these failed opportunities, because the long-term difference that they're going to make is, is tiny. Thank you so much.